More of the Zach Gelb Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. All right, welcome back in. Rutgers football season right around the corner, but a lot going on off the field right now with the allegations against Rutgers in terms of recruiting, grades, and also the positive drug tests uh, from the era of Kyle Flood. And uh, we know there was a meeting in uh, Friday in Indianapolis in front of the NCAA committee with current Rutgers employees and also former a Rutgers employee, the man that has been all on the scene and has uh, been having extensive uh, reporting on this issue has been Ryan Dunleavy, who does a tremendous job covering the Rutgers football team from NJ.com, and he's kind enough to hop on board with us right now. Ryan, appreciate a few minutes. Thanks for the time, and how are you? Good, Zach. How are you? Well, I'm doing great, and we appreciate you coming on. So we just said it. You know, We know the allegations. We know there's been self-imposed penalties, and then Friday was a big day. We know the wait does begin as you did say in your article, catch us up to date about what happened on Friday and what is the latest with the current uh, state of the Rutgers program in response to these allegations. So basically, Rutgers had self-imposed some sanctions a couple months ago that will restrict the uh, amount of recruiting official visits they can have and off-campus days that Rutgers uh, will be able to recruit and some of the ways that coaches can can initiate contact with recruits and a $5,000 fine and a year of probation. Uh, so Rutgers imposed some sanctions, basically went out to Indianapolis and said, look, this is what we uh, have imposed and our, our program has none of these same people in who are alleged. The Kyle Flood, the former coach, Julie Herman, the former athletic director, Dr. Monaco, the former chief medical examiner, Daryl Wilson, the assistant coach, all of them except Herman were charged with a show cause order, which means it would be hard for them to work in college athletics again if they're uh, found guilty. So Rutgers basically said, from our end, we've imposed these sanctions. We've been proactive uh, cleaning house, so to speak, and uh, please don't punish us any more than this. And uh, NCAA has their right to uh, add on some sanctions or accept those as is, and the individual cases are held separately. Basically, each, uh, each allegation against each person or party is addressed one by one. They went through them. There were no explosive fireworks or new revelations or anything. It was all just kind of a chance to explain yourselves in front of the governing body on infractions. And now they, t- they get together, and in about eight weeks, maybe ten weeks, uh, we'll know uh, we'll know if what Rutgers did was enough, and we'll know if those people can work in college football ever again. Do you think what they did with the self-imposed penalties is enough, and do you think they'll get the help from the NCAA by these self-imposed penalties? It's hard to say, right? Like I, I think Rutgers did a good. When you look at other cases, Louisville, North Carolina, Syracuse, there's not a perfect example to match up to Rutgers because Jim Beheim was still at the coach of Syracuse, so he got suspended and they vacated wins. Rick Pitino is still the coach of Louisville, so he's suspended for like nine ACC games, or six ACC games this year. Well, it's, you can't suspend Chris Ash or, or any of these people because they, they didn't do this. This wasn't them. And you can't suspend Kyle Flood because he's coaching the Atlanta Falcons. So it's very strange. There's no perfect just position where I could say they did this to school X, so they're going to do this to Rutgers. I think if I, if it was me personally, I probably would have went a little further if I was Rutgers, but that doesn't mean that I maybe would have done two years of probation, something like that, but that doesn't mean by any means that that's how the NCAA is viewing it. I mean, or they could, they could slap Rutgers with vacated wins, which Again, my personal opinion is that's the most meaningless thing in Agreed. college sports, vacating wins. Because I, I was at the Quick Lane Bowl in 2014. I missed Christmas at home. I, you can't tell me that I wasn't there. I know I was there. I saw it. So vacating wins, I always think is silly. I don't think it'll get to the point of scholarships or a postseason ban. I don't think Rutgers is looking at either of those things. Yeah, I agree with you on the uh, the bull ban part. I don't think that's going to be in play here. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday after reading your article as we're talking uh, to Ryan Dunleavy. But why does the NCAA, why do they still vacate wins? Because it seems very antiquated to do that. Because like you're saying, we all been to those games. We all saw what happened. I don't know why they still do it. To be honest. I guess I because guess they don't have a better solution, right? It's why the NCAA uh, does, still does a lot of outdated things that the NCAA does because there's no perfect way uh, – to punish a school where 
the pe- where the school do you punish the people or do you punish the school? It's like the old John Calipari thing, right? Where he left UMass for uh, Memphis and UMass got put on probation, and you know it's one of those things. Like, how do you punish the school? Uh, when the when you don't find out about the allegations or the alleged wrongdoing or whatever till after the fact, you can't you can't hold them out of this uh, the tournament they already won. You know you can't uh, you can't say to Rutgers, oh sorry, you can't go to the Quick Lane Bowl two years ago. You can't rewind time. So vacated wins, I guess, uh, is their way to uh, their way to you know rewrite the record books. But firstly, I mean, what drives the world, Zach? Money. So to me, it's fines are always fines would be the best way to handle it. How do you reflect on the uh, flood era now, looking back at it with the allegations that have been made and also uh, knowing that the school did take uh, self-imposed penalties uh, from with what happened under Coach Kyle Flood? It's a very strange era. I mean, when you think back at it, Rutgers won their first ever big, uh, first ever conference title. Remember, Rutgers was in a conference goal. They joined the Big East in 91. So they won their share of their first ever title. He had a winning record, which was 27 and 24. They went to three bowl games in four years. Um, they went eight and five in their first Big Ten year, which I think is it better than anybody ever thought they would do uh, then or think they're going to do for the next couple years. Uh, but when you look at it, it's obviously all under a dark cloud, a big stain here because of what happened in 2015. I mean, obviously, the flood era is not remembered well. He will not be one of the best coaches, and he would, does not belong anywhere near the best coaches in Rutgers history because uh, obviously they're going to get under sanction, which is new for Rutgers football. They're going to, you know, they, they always prided themselves on having a clean program and having an academically sound program, and uh, now his era is going to result in allegations, and his era is going to result in an academic impropriety scandal. But to say it's just him is unfair because college athletics whether it's the Chris Ash era, the Kyle Flood era, or the Greg Schiano era, is not just about the coach. He's the one who stands up and talks to the media every day. But you have to have the right support people around you, whether it's, you know, academics or drug testing or whatever, and you have to have the right boss, the right athletic director. So it's not just the Flood era, it's the Flood Herman era. And that was obviously a failure at Rutgers. And we know Julie uh, Herman was a train wreck. I'm not a big supporter of hers as we're talking to Ryan uh, Dunley, the Avenger.com. Uh, moving forward with this new era and this new regime that's in her with Pat Hobbs, who I happen to like a lot, and I believe in Chris Ash, but it comes down to a lot of it recruiting in the Big Ten, which is a tough task uh, for Rutgers just because of some of the likes and the powerhouses they have to go up against. So far, how do you evaluate? I know it's tough to do. How do you evaluate uh, this year under Hobbs and also Chris Ash? Uh, the football year? I'm, I'm just talking about in general with Hobbs in terms of the whole athletic department and then Ash in terms of football. I mean, I think with I look, there, there's no sugarcoating it right there. They, you, the jury's kind of, they've done a lot of things that Rutgers haven't done, right? I feel like there's a groundbreaking ceremony every four months at Rutgers, which is incredible because there wasn't one for 25 years. So that's hard to believe. Then you look at Chris Ash's recruiting. The first year, the, 20, the 2017 class, the incoming freshman there, even if Rutgers struggles on the field this year, Rutgers fans will have something to be excited about because this class of freshmen – is uh, going to play. I mean, you're talking about, well, 15 kids probably who are going to play as true freshmen. That, that signals a bright future. So there are things they're doing well. But the jury's out because at the same time, you, you don't know. They haven't gotten their first Big Ten revenue check. They won't get it till 2020. The playing field is incredibly lopsided. Rutgers was behind the East teams when it came to fundraising and facilities. Then you put them in the premier conference for those things, and they're way behind. And they're only getting further behind because those schools are getting increased pay and Rutgers pay is getting is staying standard as far as uh, revenue sharing from the Big Ten. So, which is largely responsible, which the, the revenue keeps growing largely because Rutgers is in the conference and the New York media market and the Big Ten network is uh, – generating monstrous revenues for the conference. So the jury's kind of out on that regard. And then call it what it is. There's the negative side, right? I ran through the positives. I ran through why it's hard to judge. Then there's the negative. Rutgers won 20-something percent of their Big Ten games this year overall as an athletic department. 
just not good enough. It's whether it's football, basketball, what uh, soccer, lacrosse, baseball, whatever it is, you have to compete. And I know football and basketball drive the bus, but when you're Rutgers and you're fighting a national perception uh, image problem, you have to do better than winning 20% of your game. In terms of football, just your general expectations for this Rutgers football team this upcoming year, and also uh, how many Big Ten wins can you expect out of them this year? I think the, a, a fair number of Big Ten games to expect would be probably two. I think that would probably – they'll get nine. I think two is probably fair to expect. I think if they get less than two, you'll be disappointed. If they get to three, I think most fans, most realistic fans would be happy. They have Purdue at home. They have at Illinois. They have Maryland at Yankee Stadium. They're at Indiana. Uh, those are the four that jump out really as – Winnable. And then Michigan State is a huge question mark, right? Because with Michigan State, are they the three-win team from last year or are they the 2015 Big Ten uh, champs who were in the college football playoff, right? So if you say you have four or five quote-unquote winnable games, if they can get two or three out of that, that makes sense. They're still light years away from beating Penn State, um, Ohio State, Michigan, Nebraska. That's not happening. So that's four losses. Um, but to me, that's not really what it's about, Zach. If I'm tell- if I'm being honest, if I think I'm a Rutgers, if I'm a Rutgers football fan, to me, it's about the scores. It's about when I'm watching the ESPN bottom line. What what score flashes across? Did my team lose 24-10? Did they lose 31-14? Some score that every con- team in the country loses by every week, or did they lose 59 nothing and 78 nothing? and some of those scores that Rutgers lost by last year when they were shut out four times. I mean, to me, that's where the improvement needs to be. It needs to be – they need to be more competitive. It's not about winning. They need to show progress on the scoreboard. I agree with you because you if you have another game like you did last year up against Michigan, that's just going to continue to drive the bus of the negative narrative of some with this Rutgers program. I know they're very far away from competing and, and being um, you know, a team that can get a victory up against a Penn State and Michigan and Ohio State with this current group. But can they play a respectable game this year up against one of those three teams? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, to play four respectable games against those teams, I think would be a lot to ask. Yeah. Could they play one of those games respectable or two of those games respectable? Sure, I don't know what Michigan is. Michigan lost 15 starters to the NFL. I mean, Everyone's assuming that because Jim Harbaugh's recruiting classes are near the top of the country that they're going to just reload. Well, we know Urban Meyer's going to reload because we've seen Urban Meyer reload. So I have no doubt that Ohio State, whatever the 11 names are that they're going to put on the field, is going to be a top-five team in the country. Is Michigan? I don't know. Rutgers beat Michigan two years ago. So I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. When Rutgers beat Michigan two years ago, Michigan, Rutgers had a lot of veterans, and Michigan had a lot of kids who were young who then were on that team last year who won 78 nothing. So I don't know. I don't know. Could they play Michigan? Could they play Nebraska? A lot of people think Nebraska is a 6-6, six and 7-5 six, and five team. Could Rutgers compete with them? Yeah, I think they could compete with them. To ask them to compete with all four, especially with Penn State and Ohio State, who if you ask me today, I'd put both those teams in my final four right now. If you ask me to predict the final four, I'd tell you the Big Ten's going to have two of them. So I don't think Rutgers can compete with either of those teams. All right, Ryan Dunleavy with us. Before we let you run, final one, I know you were writing about Todd Frazier today uh, with his connections to this area going to Rutgers and also with this heroic performance in the Little League World Series. Just how about a thought on uh, Todd Frazier joining the New York Yankees? I think it's neat. i got to say, I, I've gotten to know Frazier a little bit over the last couple of years. i gone, gone out to Yankee Stadium and Citizens Bank Park when he was in town with the Reds and the White Sox respectively and I got to I got to tell you there is it's it's neat right like when when I go to these games you you always there's always a Tom's River section of the of the visiting fans and Frazier's always playing catch with a little kid and it's not a show if you ask anybody who knows him that's who he genuinely is he's a 12 year old playing a playing in a 31 year old man's body he grew everybody's seen the photo of him and Derek Jeter when he was you know a young kid standing next to Jeter after winning the Little League World Series. Everybody's seen that photo. Everybody knows he grew up, you know, going to Yankee games and whatnot. And listen, he is, by all accounts, whether you pick the 98 World Series, what he did at Rutgers winning Big big East Player of the Year and leading them to a Big Ten tournament title, or the 2015 Home Run Derby, 
show he put on in front of the home fans of Cincinnati. What we know about Todd Frazier is Todd Frazier loves the big moment. He comes up big in the big moment. He loves it. He almost has a charmed baseball life. So where does that fit in? If you, I know in Philadelphia or other places, they have Boston, they're not going to want to hear this. But where does that fit in? That's the Yankee way, right? Some sort of charmed life where big moments happen. So in a way, in that way, he was kind of made to have to, to wear pinstripes and see if it happens. I mean, whether it does or not, who knows? He's had a down year. His average is down. But it would not surprise me at all to see Todd Frazier hitting big home runs in September. Brian, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Great stuff as always. Thanks for having me on, Zach.